Chapter 33 Initiation I looked at the screens while Reynolds stood behind me to check on all the prisoners shackled to the chairs, losing their minds, and Looks good, said Reynolds. Today's an easy one, too. We'll switch off out there. And then the king said he wants to meet you at his personal brunch after your shift. See me? After my shift? How long was I stuck here again? Because I wasn't sure if I could stay another second with Reynolds standing over me. We were both checking the monitors, but the only thing happening was my panic escalating into physical pain. A crow began to flutter when a sharp sensation cut through my brain. Looking at the screen, circular blobs began contorting into alien signs. Oozing and melting, my sight dripped when one large spiral gave birth to a white pupil before I watched a giant eye sprout in front of me, and she twisted herself upright out of thin air. Wow. Yes, there was one eye looking back at me from within this mother. Caught in a trance, everything was contorting to an impossible realization when... And the king didn't say why, said Reynolds. He just said he needs to talk to you once you're done here. That's all I know. Reynolds stepped into view and cut out the vision of Ma's eye. She vanished as his body came and sat in the chair beside me. What in the world had happened all last night? Again, a panic erupted. I couldn't watch the screen any longer, and I couldn't acknowledge the man beside me either. Both were terrorizing me without even trying. And why didn't I release my family? I was a dead man walking, and my killer may have been sitting right next to me all along. Well, it's the same old shit. Let's get to it. We'll take turns. You want to go first, or should I? asked Reynolds. I did not want to go first. Not at all. And certainly not last. But then I realized that there was no way I could stay behind. There was only one soul I trusted, and he was in the central station. My eye caught Reynolds for a moment when a demonic vision appeared. I'll go first. I'll do it. I didn't have a plan, but T. Hammond jumped up from the chair while the dark hallucination was grabbing for my attention. Avoiding Reynolds altogether, the body grabbed a set of shackles from the back table. No idea what T. Hammond was thinking, but as long as I had something to hold on to, then I'm sure I looked busy. On my way out of the room, Hammond opened the door. What's that smell? asked Reynolds. That smells like... Pulling the door shut, I cut off his voice when the panic settled. My mind instructed our body to march down the hall one foot after the other. Following the smell, Hammond walked my ass to the darkest corner where there were no cameras to follow us. I dropped the shackles when I arrived at Cicero Central Station. That was quick, said Cicero. What'd you learn? That I'm a dead man, and I don't know what to do. The mother told me the same thing. That's why we have to stay focused, said Cicero. No, we've got big problems. My comrade is here for work, and I'm stuck torturing people I love. Do you know what that's like? No idea. Why on earth would you hurt someone? That's against the first rule, said Cicero. Easier said than done. He was a good teacher, but a stubborn friend. For all I knew, my other comrade was sitting at the desk watching the screens and wondering, Where the hell are you, Jack? Did you hear that? What was it? said Cicero. I heard a voice. It was as clear as day. I heard my comrade wondering where I was. You're tuning in, said Cicero. When the mind becomes clear, we can tune into the world around us. That's what those mushrooms do. They act like mini transmitters that propel us deep into our subconscious. And why should I believe you? Well, do you have any more mushrooms? asked Cicero. Look at that. I've got two full bottles still. They say the first warriors were sacred clowns foraging for mushrooms in the wilderness to survive the dark night of the soul, said Cicero. And how was this kitten so content? I caught her paws examining the shackles and chains we brought. And what's this? asked the kitten. A leash for humans. Oh, you're already a step ahead. What's she talking about? She's right. Bring your commander here and we'll put the metal leash on him. After you chain him up, then we'll interrogate him. We have to see what he knows, said Cicero. Restraining Reynolds wasn't a bad idea. As long as we didn't hurt him, then Ma wouldn't be upset. The animals and I agreed upon a plan when my stomach rumbled. Turning back toward the control room, I twisted the orange cap off the bottle and ate a couple mushrooms for breakfast on the way back. I swallowed them before T. Hammond's hand twisted the door open. Where were you? asked Reynolds. Something strange is going on out there. Yeah, it smells funky, said Reynolds. Interesting. This way. And then without hesitation, a swan bolted down the hall in front of me. Reynolds jumped up from his seat and followed me. Deep rivers run quiet, and the less I talk, the better. What the hell was that? And I couldn't see you on the screens. What's happening? Said Reynolds. Something is hiding. Maybe someone, I whispered. Affirmative, said Reynolds. Silent as two mice, we crept through the hall toward the burning incense smoke while the walls erupted with cries of desperation on all sides. It was horrible to see what we'd done. Even worse to hear it out loud. Well, we only have one chance to get it right, but I still hadn't a clue what Cicero and the kitten were planning. What's that smell? whispered Reynolds. It was delightful. 
and all the effects of the magical scent were amplifying my confidence. The incense brought me to a centered state where my mind focused on Cicero's moral code. Now the visuals were impossible to describe, and so I can't quite tell you how it looks. You'll just have to try it for yourself and see. But Ma was busy making a wheel spin in front of me while Reynolds and I walked down toward the darkest hall. He grabbed a flashlight from his hip to expose the billowing smoke pouring out from the vent. That smoke! If fire touches these walls, we're done for. We need air, said Reynolds. Before I could answer, Reynolds took a key from his belt and stuck it into the lock over the gate called Rubbish Bin. It was across from the vent when he opened the bin before fresh sunlight and air came pouring in. I was never going to harm him, but thank God Reynolds exposed an exit to this maze. He reached into the vent and took hold of the mother's offering before tossing the first handful out. He was trying to terminate our gift when Cicero dove out from the vent with his jaw towards Reynolds' face. Grabbing the shackles, I watched Reynolds back up to fend off the opossum. The kitten spooked him next as she hissed before he stepped back into the collar as I fastened it around his neck. His hand reached for the metal when I popped the lock shut. What the? He turned. Now Ma had all control. Pressing him forward, he fell to the floor and reached for his neck when I locked his hands together behind his back. He was squirming like a snake among the smoke, trying to climb up on his knees when... What the hell are you doing? He screamed. I cuffed his ankle, then the other, before I secured the last lock. Cicero and the kitten emerged beside me. Let me go! Get off me! yelled Reynolds. This isn't funny! No, it is, I told him. This is even better than the plan I imagined. Now ask him, said Cicero. Ask him what? I whispered. Find out why he's doing all this, he added. Why are you doing this? I demanded. Reynolds was puzzled when he looked up at me. I pulled his copper helmet off to find his human head. Oh, goodness, he was one of us. We were all just humans caught in a terrible trap. Doing what? he asked. The poor man was chained up and I had no choice but to keep the leash on him. What's with all the extraction? Why would you torture someone? These are living people, for goodness sakes. You know the rules. We can't hurt anyone. Chained like a hog, his panic started off the same as all the other slaves. Now the roles were reversed for this man, and never in his life had he imagined the cuffs would be on him. You know just as much as I do. It's whatever Evol said. We're looking for some light or something. He was gasping for breath. He's right, I whispered to the pack. They'd do anything for that light. See, then they know something about the eternal flame. If their leader is willing to break these humans to get it, it must be the healing kind of light. Ask him how we find the illumination of the heat, said Cicero. You're freaking me out, man, said Reynolds. You're taking those drugs in there, aren't you? That's why you started the fire. You're lit like a torch. T. Hammond didn't need to wait for Cicero's orders. He was talking too much, so we pulled him up and dragged him down the hall into a new cell alone. The incense plume was pouring into every cell, bringing the sacred sense of the Almighty Father beside everyone who was trapped. Reynolds was thrashing about, not enthusiastic about the process, and he even spit at T. Hammond's helmet. The poor human was saying the most dreadful things about us when I fastened him to the chair. Hammond and I both knew what comes next. He was secure in the cell, and next the screen goes on. It happened to us, we did it to them, and now it was coming to the man who deserved it most. I turned toward the black screen, just as they taught me to do it. But when I reached for the power button, I inhaled a fresh breath of incense when the mother's voice burst into view. Wait. Wait and see. As if the moon sent a sign, I felt the bright light beaming through my forehead when I took control of T. Hammond's suit and forbid the body to turn the screen on. We turned away and took his body back the other way. I left the screen blank because I wasn't going to hurt another living soul. Not today. I feel the light. I feel the healing. You're doing it, said Cicero. That's the immortal flame. How'd you conjure it? The kitten and the opossum were basking in my presence, pressing their foreheads against my body. A light was coming from up above, peeking from the crown of my head, generating a reaction from these animals. It was coming from my forehead. And how had I found it? Even I was caught in a blissful trance of compassion. It was the peak of loving kindness. And how could these animals feel it too? The light was warming Cicero's body when he stopped shivering altogether. Evil was right all along. There was something powerful to this illumination. It was as if I transcended my own mind, and I felt the physical and mental worlds come together inside this body. The dark night breaks us in order to illuminate the great light within, said Cicero. But we'll need even more of it if we want to spark the mother's eternal blaze. This light was the truth, but soon my animal friends and I became concerned as this conscious light started fading. We let go of it together, for this light was not something to hang on to, but rather something to appreciate in the moment as it comes before it goes.
My awareness grew somber as I watched it fade before I closed the door on Reynolds' cell. I am not my body, but I have a body. I am not my mind, but this mind has thoughts. I carry the light given to me by my father and mother. That's what I felt. This was not I, this was not me. They had given me a human vessel, but it was the light coming through remotely. God had filled me with creative potential, but how on earth could I produce more of this healing essence? Love is what makes the light grow, said Cicero. When we choose love over fear, the illumination begins to flow. You think this is love? I paused. Don't you understand what pain I've put people through? I have hurt the people I love. I'd gone so high, to a place so peaceful, and there wasn't enough energy to sustain this brightness. Anger took hold of my mind and clouded the light before it vanished as my senses turned dull. Ma abandoned us inside the body again. This is why we call it the dark night of the soul, said Cicero. The hero's journey is not settled in comfort. First you were separated from the crowd to become awakened. Today you are initiated, and soon we shall burn bright like a lamp in dark days. The opossum was committed to the highest path, and yet his body was shivering cold again. We needed more light, but all I could do was help him climb back into the vent beside the remains of our offering. The fire had died down when a flock of swans had discovered the exit. Now many animals found their way to the fresh air before departing into the forest. The mind was observing our situation while Hammond packed more incense into the vents. If a dying opossum can survive in our trash, then I too must do my best to support the lives of all sentient beings. Cicero was one of us, a creature with loyal tendencies, and I would have never realized this light existed if not for our great teacher. Thank you. Thank you, my lord. Did you battle against the dark night? Yes, I did. It was the mother who showed me the way. Her name was Sahaja. She showed me a path, so that I may show you, said Cicero. Sparking the flint, the incense began to burn. I remember waving to Cicero and the kitten before T. Hammond turned around as if we'd had enough. No words yet, just observing and I guess I was on autopilot when T. Hammond took our legs back to work. The mind was aware, and I soon noticed how these thoughts were no longer berserk. Mushrooms were on my mind when I opened the door to the control room and knew there was only one big button left to press. T. Hammond brought us forward when Evil burst into the room. Bravo, my dearest! Oh, you did it! I'm so proud of you! Congrats, my boy! I stood perfectly still. Evil wouldn't move. He turned and pointed to the orange pill bottles in my side pocket. I didn't know the journey would require so much, said Evol. Which ones got you there? Which substances did you use? He began reaching into my pockets and discovered the mushrooms. Magic, said Evol. I was always rooting for the psychedelics. Now we know the truth. What truth, I asked. He escorted me back into a chair. The room felt dense and heavy when he squeezed my legs in place under the desk. Had he seen the video feed? Had he smelled the scent? The big mushroom button was right beside me, and I wasn't looking for his consent. I really am fascinated by you. I didn't expect all this courage from such an innocent creature, said Evol. How'd you overcome the fear? Most people break and never recover, but you, you've been present right here in God's moment. The moment. Yes, there was only one moment, and it was always right here. You're the only one I caught willing to risk it all. I can't believe you've got your comrade tied to a chair in cell 56, said Evil, pointing at the screen with Reynolds on it. Now I'm willing to make a trade. I won't tattle on you, but promise you'll make me more of that light. I was stuck and I needed a plan. If only I talked to Cicero again. Wait, but how did he know about the light? You didn't think I'd notice, asked Evil. I was meditating upstairs when I saw your third eye open like a sun rising over the horizon. You were illuminating all 18 levels between us. These walls are pure stone, and I felt your glow less than ten minutes ago. By the time I got here, all I found was your buddy locked in that cell. You ready to make a deal? What kind of deal? I wondered. Make me one promise, and I'll grant you any wish you desire, said Evol. State your demands, but then I get to pick something in return. What do you want? See, that's the thing. I want more light, and I need you to promise that you'll make me more. Say the words, and you can have whatever you'd like in return. It was odd timing. That incense was pouring into the room, and I wanted to speak to my lord first, but the mind was alone with evil. His strategy was set up like a labyrinth, and somehow this genie was granting me a wish in return? My eye glanced at the red mushroom button. You already know the rules. The moon is watching. You can do whatever you like in this life, but there's that one clause about harm, said evil. What clause? 
Whatever harm you do always comes back to you, said Evol. And I manage the karmic debt. That is why I have the crown of all suffering, and I pay it back whenever I feel it's due. That mushroom button was right in front of me. I'll even help with anything you want, said Evol. And I wondered about this masked man. Should I be gambling with a rogue creature? He was a lone crusader who was willing to forsake his own king, but I knew something he never saw coming. I was a masked man too. Promise me you'll make whatever light is required, said Evol. I promise. I'll do it. Good. Now what'll it be, said Evol. I didn't ask, but rather I made the choice when I ordered T. Hammond to lift the glass case before we pressed the big mushroom button down. All at once, every cell door was unlocked and opened. The only thing left to do was release the shackles and set everyone free. Promise you won't say a word, I told him. I promise I won't say anything, and I even applaud your chaos, said Evol. But now it's my turn. I need to borrow one of these prisoners, because it's the only way you and I are going to conjure the rest of our light.